Good morning and welcome to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. I'm your pharmacist, Paul White. We're very glad you joined us this morning. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Altman Health Systems, Studio Arts and Glass, and Genuer Appraisals and Liquidations. Today, Brad and I are broadcasting from our administrative offices, and our very special guest is Dr. Ryan Drake, who was with us quite a while ago uh, in the WHBDC studio. And uh, Dr. Ryan Drake is a neurologist at NeuroCare Center and principal investigator at Neuroscience Research Center. Dr. Drake is board certified in neurology, neuromuscular medicine, and electrodiagnostic medicine. Good morning, Dr. Drake, and welcome back to the show. Good morning, and thanks for ha having me. It's a uh... It's been a little while. I think the last time I was on, I talked about Botox and and chemo denervation, mm -hmm. um, and it was fun to kind of be in this in the studio. It's not as exciting here in my <laughs> my office, but <laughs> but that's okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what they they wouldn't let us in there for a long time because of Corona, and so we've, Brad worked the system out. So we've been here since then. So that's fine. We think it works out okay. So. I think so. Yeah. All right. Well, dementia is a general term for memory loss and other cognitive abilities serious enough to interfere with daily life. Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 80% of dementia cases. And today, more than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's kills more than a breast cancer and prostate cancer patients combined, with deaths from Alzheimer's increasing 145% since the year 2000. While Alzheimer's is a familiar term, more than 80% of Americans know little or are not familiar with mild cognitive impairment, which can be an early stage of Alzheimer's. Early intervention is critical, so it's important <clears throat> that we learn how to recognize signs and symptoms that we should bring to our doctor's attention. This morning, we're going to talk with Dr. Drake and learn about the risk factors for Alzheimer's along with diagnosis and treatment. We'd like to remind our listeners that our program is available on our podcast. Just look for Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy in your favorite podcast app, and please subscribe. Okay, doctor. Welcome. As I said uh, before, you've been on the show before, but it's been quite a while back, and we're very happy to have you back. Uh, welcome back again to the show again. Please introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your practice. Sure. Thanks for ha having me. I I'm a general neurologist uh, in, in town. I work at NeuroCare. I'm also a, a principal investigator uh, within our research arm, Neuroscience Research Center. Um, I grew up in Salem, Ohio, so not too far from here. Uh, my wife, who's Dr. Jennifer Drake, um, who has an expertise in epilepsy and sleep disorders uh, is also with us at, at NeuroCare. Um, and so we've, we've been in town for 15 years, uh, the entire time at, at NeuroCare. Um, and so it's just been really nice to take care of patients within Stark County and really um, many surrounding counties. So, uh where did you receive your training? And not in was, Salem, not in Salem, Ohio, certainly. No, no. <laughs> so I, I, I was, I did my neurology training uh, in Richmond, Virginia, at Virginia oh. Commonwealth University, um, and that's a, a four-year program. We do the first year of mostly internal medicine and three years of neurology, and then um, I did a optional fellowship year at Duke University, where I did uh, more nerve and muscle disease. Hmm. Interesting. So how long have you been a practicing neurologist? I, I've been here for nearly 15 years. It's amazing how how time flies, um, but it's been, it's been fun. I think one thing that we'll talk about here in a little bit when we chat about Alzheimer's is, you know, I first started there there were many diseases that did not have a lot of treatment or really not any good treatments. And we, we've seen that shift a bit, still not where we want to be in many disease states, but I, I now have a lot more tools to help manage patients than I did when I started. Okay. Tell us about your practice and, and what all uh, you do. Sure. Um, as I mentioned, um, I'm at NeuroCare. We're the only neurology group in Stark County, and 
we see patients, you know, probably as far as an hour and a half east and west and two hours south of, of Canton, a fairly big uh, catchment of, of uh, patients. Most of what we do is, is outpatient neurology, seeing patients in our office. Uh, that's about 85% of what we do. But we also do inpatient neurology, um, both at Cleveland Clinic Mercy and, and at Altman Hospital, uh, where we're seeing acutely ill patients who are who are having strokes and ongoing seizures, as, as an example. The, the group of us, there's five neurologists, uh, and I'll do a, a little bit of a dad brag about my, my partners. You know, I, I always say how well-trained they are. Um, you know, if, if you look at the five of us, we've either trained at Duke, at Mayo yeah. Clinic, or, or Harvard. Um, and wow. so we've been fortunate to bring that knowledge uh, back to the, the area, um, and it's a really good practice. Um, we have a, a physiatrist, a rehab physician, Dr. Napsinger, and then we have seven advanced practice providers in our group, physician assistants and nurse practitioners, who um, also help to, we collaborate with to, to help take care of our, of our patients. Um, and that's our day to day. We do a lot of sleep disorders. We have a, a sleep clinic uh, and an in lab uh, sleep center where we diagnose sleep disorders such as sleep apnea. Um, so it's it's a nice size uh, group, and at this point, it's family. Hmm. But where are your offices, doctor? So we we have an office. Our main hub is in in Canton on Dressler. Uh, that's also uh, where the research center is a, as well. And then we have an office in Alliance and an office in in Oroville. Th those are our two satellite offices. Hmm. And your sleep apnea pro, uh, facility is that with your office or? Yes, we it's uh it, it it's in our our building here where um, patients um, come and and do an overnight study with our sleep techs um, to help uh, sort out what type of sleep disorder. Sometimes it's not an obstructive sleep apnea um, and it's an, an alternative, a primary sleep disorder. Um, and then they will often follow up with, we have three, uh, three of the neurologists are board certified in sleep medicine. So they will see um, that so even my patients who have sleep disorders, I, I say I have three experts here in the building. So I will often have my patients see one of them just for a sleep consultation. It's hard for me to imagine that people have difficulty sleeping. I really, you know, <laughs> about 11 o'clock at night, man, boom, you know, I'm out. So amazing. Yeah, the, yeah it's nice. I mean, there, there are people and myself included that, um, you know, don't have any problems sleeping, but there is a lot of patients who have uh, insomnia, problems falling asleep, waking up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the the big one is undiagnosed sleep apnea. You used to mm -hmm. just think it's a, you know, a snoring problem or a tiredness problem, but it's really a systemic disease. It, it um, contributes negatively to, to memory. It accelerates hardening of the arteries in our heart and our brain. And so that's mm. why we're uh, very aggressive in, in trying to diagnose and treat um, OSA or obstructive sleep apnea. Wow. That's just amazing. Doctor, you mentioned a number of different patient types that you see. Are there any other patient types you want to bring up? I, I think that my only comment is we the number one diagnosis that we see in our office is is migraine. There's about 40 million Americans who have migraine. And and uh, so we see a lot of migraine. That's probably about 15 to 20 percent of our day. Okay. Man. So, all right. So you're also involved in research at NeuroCare. Can you share with the public uh, what that's like? Yeah. So from a research standpoint, we are involved in clinical trials. And this is when a pharmaceutical company has some type of, of compound or drug, and it's been studied in, in animal models, and then it's... Um, felt to be safe for human trials. And initially, if, if we talk about um, clinical trials, 
uh, there's four phases. There's phase one, two, three, and four. Phase one is typically healthy volunteers. They're given some dose, um, sometimes high doses of the medicine, of which it's uh, safety data only. Phase two and phase three trials are trying to gather more safety data, but also efficacy data, how well the drug works. And more often than not, you need two phase three trials to be positive for that drug to go to the FDA to be reviewed and approved so that we can have access to um, the, the drug for all physicians or other providers um, okay. to write. And so what, what we are is we're one of the sites where we recruit patients for various um, trials really across the neurologic spectrum. Um, and I really felt it was important to continue and really uh, ramp up our, our trial department because as I mentioned, when I started 15 years ago, lots of um, neurologic diseases that didn't have any treatments don't or don't have good treatments that still exists today there are many disease states that don't have um, good treatment options for patients and so bringing these trials in allow patients to be enrolled if they want to you know again we talk with patients about it's not a guarantee that it's going to work all good trials patients are either given the drug or a placebo. So not everyone is guaranteed to even get that, that drug, um, at least in the, in the first part of, of a trial. But if you don't have trials in Canton or Northeast Ohio, then patients are having to travel to Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Columbus. It's just not feasible. Interesting. How about we take our first break here, doctor? Uh, you're listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Welcome back to Health Matters. It's not too late to get a flu shot. Stop in any medicine pharmacy today. No appointment necessary. We look forward to helping you stay healthy. So, doctor, how long have you been doing research in the community? We've been doing research my entire 15 uh, years that, that I've been here. Um, I did research when I was a resident as a sub-investigator, um, and that's not the principal investigator. When you're a principal investigator, you're responsible for everything at that site. Um, when you're a sub-investigator, you may be responsible for certain scales such as um, a, a timed walking test that's required or a certain memory uh, scale. Um, and then when I started at NeuroCare, one of the physicians was running the research department, um, entering retirement, and I, I kind of took that over and have escalated that up um, over the last five or six years. It must be quite an undertaking to be part of that. I can only imagine the record keeping and the restrictions and, and the protocols you have to follow. What, um, how does a patient get involved with the trial? Is it, can you talk about that process a little bit? Yeah, mo most of our trials of which patients are enrolled come from our practice. So we talk with patients, let's say that they come in uh, for an evaluation for Alzheimer's as an example, and there's not any and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later, there haven't been any disease modifying therapy for pre-Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's. And we'll talk about offering patients the enrollment in a trial versus some non-medication management of, of Alzheimer's. And so the, if patients have interest, then they go upstairs to our research and department and um, often are given pamphlets or information, uh, consents for trials, and then that's how patients are enrolled from our practice. Now, we often have um, patients who are calling in uh, from the, the community to our research department, and then they come in for a quick screening visit uh, regarding their memory. Um, we often have to get notes or charts from their primary care or maybe other neurologists um, in, you know, an hour radius or two hour radius. Um, so it's either patients calling in primary care referring because they know about our, our trials, but most of it is us sitting down with our patients. And that's just part of the education piece, uh, that, that we provide. Very interesting. Um, 
what are you what are, are, are you're involved i'm sure right now in clinical trials what are they what, what sort of uh, issues are you dealing with yeah the majority of of the trials that we're in right now uh probably 50 percent at least are within the realm of alzheimer's and mm. when you when you talk about alzheimer's you know historically you had Alzheimer's and the only medications that we've had are what we call symptomatic medications like Aricept or Namenda known as Donepazil or Mamantine. These medicines don't do anything for the disease itself. They essentially allow the nerves in our brain to, to talk better. But as time goes on in Alzheimer's, these nerves are, are degrading. And these, these medicines don't repair these nerves or stop the, the process. So the majority of newer clinical trials are disease modifying. They're trying to go after what's creating this nerve breakdown. So in, as far as it, Alzheimer's, it's amyloid plaques that they're, they're trying to go and attack. And so not only are we doing trials for Alzheimer's, but we're also doing trials for some people call pre-Alzheimer's, which is MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Mm. In the past, we used to think, oh, you know, mom or grandma, she's, she's forgetful. That's just her age. But what we're learning is short-term memory problems that are a change from the past um, that interfere maybe a little bit with life. That's actually a clue that someone's developing Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment. And so we're doing trials not only in Alzheimer's, but a lot in MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And then interestingly, we're also doing it in preclinical Alzheimer's. So these are patients who have, they don't even have MCI, they have no cognitive issues, but they have strong risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's, including maybe family history. And so these medications are being given to those patients because in the end, we think that if we treat Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's or pre-pre-Alzheimer's very early, that's the best chance that we have. So most of our trials are within the Alzheimer's realm. We currently have um, other trials for essential tremor, which is the most common tremor in the world. There's not an FDA approved medication for essential tremor. Um, so we, we see a lot of that. We have trials for migraine. We have trials for multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease of the brain and spinal cord. And then we have trials for myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disease of our peripheral nervous system, our nerve muscle highway. Hmm. But I think our biggest interest right now is in within neurodegenerative diseases. Fancy way for saying our brains break down faster than they should and they cause problems the most common neurodegenerative disease in the world is Alzheimer's. And number two, the second most common neurodegenerative disease is Parkinson's. So the, the focus I think is Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, there's another type of dementia that's neurodegenerative as well called Lewy body dementia. And the hope is that we will find treatments to either um, delay onset or slow the, the progression. So how's Alzheimer's disease uh, different from dementia? That's a really good question. Dementia is the umbrella term. And so dementia is when patients have typically short-term memory problems. Another part of the brain is not working, like our, we call executive function, our ability to follow certain steps, point A, point B, point C, issues with attention, concentration, judgment, issues with language, getting our words out, understanding what people are saying, issues with visual spatial, so our ability to navigate with driving. So dementia is memory problems. One other of those issues that's progressive and interfering with our daily activities. That's how we define dementia. But going back, dementia is an umbrella term of which there are subtypes of dementia. The most common subtype of dementia is Alzheimer's. And that accounts for about 70% of all of the dementias. There are other types of dementia like Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's dementia, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, and others. But 
you know, I think there's a negative stigma with using the term Alzheimer's and you have patients who sometimes are referred to me for evaluation of their memory and they say, mom has, has dementia. You go through the history and exam, you come to the conclusion that it best fits the picture of Alzheimer's. And then it's kind of an eye-opening experience. Oh my goodness, mom has Alzheimer's. I thought she just had dementia. Um, when, when really it's a subtype of dementia. And so if we know someone who has dementia, odds are it's likely Alzheimer's. And I think that's a little bit why I'm here today, not only to talk about Alzheimer's and our clinical trials, but really get the word out that it's okay to use the term Alzheimer's. I think we have to um, reduce this negative stigma with the term Alzheimer's and start to talk about it earlier, because I think what's going to happen over time is that we need to talk about Alzheimer's when we're 40 years old or 50 years old, not waiting till we're in, in our 70s. Um, but again, dementia is the umbrella term. Alzheimer's is the most common subtype. Wow. It's a very complicated uh, <laughs> explanation of, of all of this. You know, it seems that we're making progress in these diseases. Is that true? I just, I know we can't rebuild the brain, okay? Once, once this thing happens, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the, why does Alzheimer's occur? There's a protein in the brain called amyloid and essentially it's, it's, starts clumping together and it forms these clumps called amyloid plaques. And these plaques then act as roadblocks within our nerve highway. And, and so as time goes on, more and more roadblocks get laid down, the, the, the exit ramps start getting closed. And then in addition to the amyloid plaques, which are being created 10 to 20 years prior to the development of clinical symptoms. Um, in addition to amyloid plaques, there's an, another protein called tau that's, that's blocking highways more within the nerve. Um, and so you have accumulation of amyloid and tau, these, these proteins. And so that's been the main theory of why does um, Alzheimer's occur. We don't really know what stimulates these, these abnormal proteins. That's the problem here. Mm -hmm. But all of the medicines that are being looked at, um, and we've had a little bit of breakthrough within the last um, year or two, are, are designed to go out and bind to the amyloid and then try to clear it from our, our brain. Um, and so that's where most of these targets are. They're trying to target the amyloid protein. They're trying to target the, the tau protein, or sometimes they're trying to target where if you think about like a bunch of grapes, so there might not be targeting the grapes, but the stem between the grapes. So they're trying to, to target the sticky substances. And I think that's where we are now. And we've had some um, breakthrough in what we call disease modifying therapy, not the symptomatic therapy, but this is what, what I referred to early as disease modifying, go after what's causing the problem. Um, are the, you know, there's essentially four drugs that have either gone to FDA or in the process of, of going to FDA. And essentially two of the four have not been favorable trials. Um, one was just approved on the 6th of this month, um, but I don't know if we're going to have access to it because there are restrictions by Medicare in paying it uh, for it. And th these are unfortunately not the answer. Um, mm. Are they clearing amyloid in our brain? Yes, but the improvements of patients' memory is not overly robust. Um, and so th that's why... I think over the next 10 years, five to 10 years, the, the clinical trial space will still be a really important space to, to try to find something that works even better. Okay, doctor, I'm, <laughs> I'm late for the break. Okay, it's, sorry. It's, it's, it's all right, I wanted to hear that. <laughs> it's the bottom of the hour, time for the news. Thanks for joining us this morning on Health.
We are back this morning. Brad and I are talking with Dr. Ryan Drake, neurologist at NeuroCare Center and principal investigator for Neuroscience Research Center. We have a lot more to cover this morning, so let's get back to the show. Okay, doctor, before the break, you talked about what causes Alzheimer's disease. Um, I wondered if you could touch on uh, what stages there are and if we know Clearly, you said we don't know why those plaques can occur, but I'm wondering, do we have any genetic or environmental links that you can touch on too? Sure. Um, so when it comes to stages of Alzheimer's, we typically talk about there's a mild, moderate, and severe stage of Alzheimer's. Mild is when patients are having problems with managing their checkbook, managing their medications, maybe getting lost in unfamiliar places with driving. Moderate is patients are really unable to manage their meds, their finances, they're not able to drive, they're not able to cook. And severe is when patients are quite bad. Um, they're often having significant language problems, issues with talking, walking, and a lot of these patients um, required 24-hour, um, not just care, but nursing care. And as I alluded to earlier, that we now know of MCI, mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is a pre-dementia state, and then even pre-clinical Alzheimer's, which is when we have risk factors for um, Alzheimer's, but have normal memory. And so there is a genetic risk. When you talk about early onset dementia, which unfortunately is less than 65 years of age, we unfortunately see patients who are in their 40s or 50s who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's. 1% of all of Alzheimer's is due to these three genes that create Alzheimer's. And if mom or dad, you just need one parent that has it, each child has a 50% risk of getting that gene. If you get that gene, you're guaranteed to get Alzheimer's. But that's only 1% of all of Alzheimer's. So we also know that families can cluster and have some family members with Alzheimer's, but it's not lots and lots of family members. So there's probably some genetic risk and it's probably multifactorial or what we call polygenic. The most common genetic risk factor is something called apolipoprotein or APOE. And we get one APOE from mom and we get one from dad. And you can either get a two, a three or a four. So most commonly in the United States, you, people are three threes, and that's a neutral risk. But if you're a three four, so you have one copy of a four, that increases your risk versus a general population by about twofold. And if you're a four four, that's really rare. It's about 2% of the US population that increases your risk by about 10 times. Um, and so um, if you um, heard um, Chris Hensworth, uh, Thor, the actor, he's, he was in a show in D Disney Plus called L Limitless, and it's talking about longevity. And unfortunately, um, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, he's, um, but he was told that he is a 4-4, four, four, un un unfortunately. And so when they talk about in that um series that he has a rare genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, they're talking about the APOE gene 4-4. What we know about the APOE gene, it's a risk factor gene. So it's not a, you're going to get Alzheimer's no matter what, where that 1% of the, that I talked about earlier, you're guaranteed. So just because you have a 4 or a 4-4, four four, it doesn't mean you're going to get it. There's there's about 30 other risk factor genes that probably play a role here in either interacting with APOE4 or creating other risks. There are patients who in lots of cohorts are 4-4 and never have get Alzheimer's. So they probably have some gene that decreases that risk in, in some way. Um, you know, what are the other what we call risk factors for Alzheimer's. We talk about non-modifiable and modifiable. So non-modifiable are you can't do anything about it. And that's your genetic risk. 
the number one um, gen the number one non-modifiable risk is your age. So your risk of Alzheimer's st at 65 years old doubles about every five years. Uh, female gender, unfortunately, is about twice as likely as male. Or that's being heavily researched, um, felt yes. probably hormonal in, in nature. And then you have your modifiable risk. Um, and your modifiable risks are all the things that we can do every day. There is research that shows if everyone in the US participated in their modifiable risk, we could eliminate 40% of Alzheimer's. So if you look at Alzheimer's, about six to six and a half million US people have Alzheimer's, as opposed to Parkinson's, it's 1 million to 1.5 million. So you, you could essentially eliminate over 2 million cases of Alzheimer's if we did our modifiable mm -hmm. risk factors. So what are our modifiable mm -hmm. risk factors? That, that is our vascular risk. So diabetes, lipids, hypertension. So really being aggressive in management of those vascular risk factors, working with your primary care to keep those in check. The, the, those are pretty huge. Exercise is the number one modifiable risk factor for Alzheimer's. And so if you're not exercising, then you, you should be. Um, you know, the and it's it's not just going on a walk, unfortunately. It's it's exercise, typically aerobic exercise that you're you're moving, you're getting your heart rate up. And it's getting your heart rate up and sustaining that for a 30 minute period of exercise. And ideally it should be five to six days a week. As long as your primary care doctor, your cardiologist says you can do that, that then you do it. Um, mm -hmm. Exercise is really important. Um, sleep is ultra important. Uh, we know that if your sleep is not regulated properly or you have undiagnosed sleep apnea, it really plays a, a role. Our diet or our nutrition is a huge risk factor as well. We know the Mediterranean diet reduces our risk of, of Alzheimer's. So I encourage listeners to go out and, and Google Mediterranean diet um, if they're really interested in not only their cardiovascular health, but their, their, their brain health. Um, other modifiable risk factors include um, learning as much as you can early in your life. So your degree of education plays a role. It's probably building up a cognitive, what we call cognitive reserve, and then learning new things um, in in middle ages uh, is is also uh, really important. Um, so those are, you know, we talk about how are we going. We, although I'm here to talk about our clinical trials and our treatment and the new science, I don't want to treat you in my office. I I want to not have to see you. And I think if the U.S population starts paying attention to these and being aggressive, we can probably delay or eliminate a fair amount of Alzheimer's. You know, you've just, I mean, the whole program has been amazing and I can't help but think we got to take our last break here, but sure. I cannot help but think why I don't understand why we are not genetically testing every patient that goes in to see their primary care to identify some of these things. I mean, I paid for all those tests, so I've got all the data you've just mentioned but it just seems like we could be so much more preventative and proactive if we acted on at least our genetic base than just finding out when it happens. But I digress, and that's another program. So, Okay. Okay. Final breaks here. You're listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Thanks for joining us today. You're in our last segment of our show, and it's very, very interesting. Doctor, do you have anything else you want to add about diagnosing Alzheimer's or other memory disorders? Yeah, I think um, to understand a little bit when patients come for an evaluation of memory, we take a fairly in-depth history to, and ideally with a, we call corroborating historians. So a, a spouse or an adult child who can help us define this timeline. And so we're looking for issues with managing meds and finances or having problems with repeating ourselves. That's part of the history. We do an exam where we're doing a neurologic exam. 
um, to make sure there's not any signs of, of Parkinson's or Lewy body, which can be other types of, of dementia, or doing a bedside memory examination um, to try to figure out what parts of the brain are not working properly. And then we do testing. Um, we always do an MRI of the, the patient's brain. And the thing that I like to have patients understand or family members is we're not doing an MRI to diagnose Alzheimer's. We're doing an MRI to look for other conditions that could mimic Alzheimer's, like a brain tumor, like increased fluid filled spaces of the brain, something called normal pressure hydrocephalus, looking for silent strokes that unfortunately can happen um, over one's lifetime. So MRI of the brain, we often do cognitive or memory labs that include B12 and thyroid disease and folic acid. Um, that's kind of the standard workup. There are some patients who maybe have uncontrolled mental health disorders, really bad depression, anxiety um, that can affect memory. And so sometimes we are doing specialized testing called neurocognitive testing that we asked our neuropsychologic colleagues to do a two or three hour memory test that really dives into all the pieces and parts of the brain. I do that in sometimes more challenging patients. I think my clinical acumen and experience over 15 years, I, I rely a little bit less on that than I did when I first started. Um, and we're weeding through making sure patients don't have medications that can affect our, our cognition because there are lots of medications that can affect our, our, our thinking. Um, things like the tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline or nortriptyline, medicines that are benzodiazepines like Ativan or, or Valium and a whole slew of others. So we're, we're making sure that meds haven't been added in a time frame of which these memory issues have occurred. We're evaluating for underlying sleep disorders, underlying mental health disorders. So that's all what we're doing. In the last handful of years, there have been some Alzheimer's specific tests that are more research-based that are now becoming commercially available. So these are what we call biomarkers that help detect those proteins in the brain, amyloid and tau. And there's some blood tests, there's some spinal fluid tests, a lumbar puncture. And then there are, there's a fancy picture of the brain called a PET scan. And there's various types of PET scans that can be done. And so we're using all of that to try to find something that's treatable, that's not Alzheimer's, making sure we're not dealing with a non-Alzheimer's dementia. And then um, most of the time, unfortunately, all that testing is normal, trying to look for the mimickers. And so in the end, when it comes down to it, patients are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but sometimes getting that diagnosis is, is the first step that's needed um, so that we can come up with a game plan. I got to throw this in. Is there any evidence that vaccines, either current or former, you know, older vaccines have a play in Alzheimer's? I'm not aware of any, any data um, that is negative for vaccines that is contributing to any negative um, cognitive uh, health at, at all. There's just so much flack right now on all the current vaccines going on out there. They're good, they're bad, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it just makes one wonder, you know, who's right? Is anybody right? <laughs> well, know? I think I, I think I, I I am not fluent in vaccine trials and the evidence behind them, but they have been studied in a good um, clinical setting, good protocols, enrolled lots of of patients. And I think in the end, what we know, like the COVID vaccine, it's not preventing COVID, it's preventing people from dying from, from COVID. Oh, um, and so, you know, that may be a better uh, question for an internist or an infectious disease physician who may know a little bit more about uh, vaccines to go on further, but no direct correlation between vaccines and the development of Alzheimer's. Interesting. So do we know how many people have Alzheimer's and how does that compare to other diseases? 
Yeah, so about 6 million Americans have Alzheimer's. Um, you know, I talked about we see a lot of migraine, about 40 million Americans have, have um, migraine. Other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, it's about 1.5 million. We, we are seeing less Alzheimer's over time because the institution of some of these healthy lifestyles, medication management, being more aggressive in treating vascular risk factors. Um, we're seeing an exponential rise in Parkinson's uh, disease. Uh, I've seen so much more PD, Parkinson's disease in the last handful of years than when I, when I first started. And unfortunately, the clinical trials and the science behind Parkinson's is probably eight to 10 years behind Alzheimer's. And so we're just not there. There are all the medicines for Parkinson's are symptomatic medications. Um, they help make our, our dopamine centers in our brain talk with our muscles. They help patients walk uh, and do their activities of daily living. But the, the, the protein in the brain, alpha-synuclein, as opposed to amyloid, alpha-synuclein, which occurs in Parkinson's disease, um, we're just, we're so much further behind, but that, that's what's exciting. I'm hoping maybe they can apply some of the science behind the treatments of Alzheimer's potentially to that alpha synuclein protein for Parkinson's. But yeah. um, un unfortunately, it's going to be, I think, a longer road. I do believe we covered all the risk factors, did we not? Diabetes and blood pressure and da da da, things along that line. Yeah, I think the only thing uh, that I didn't mention, I looked at my cheat sheet because that, that was a long uh, a list of things. Um, probably in the non-modifiable race plays a role. So a larger percentage of African-Americans and Hispanic um, it, with Alzheimer's. Um, some of that's due to the APOE4 gene. Um, and then clinical trials are really working hard. Pharmaceutical companies are really w working hard to enroll patients in those categories because they're highly underrepresented or underrepresented um, in in clinical trials. So that's uh, mm -hmm. very important as well. Um, and as far as modifiable risk factors, the other one is smoking. Smoking increases your risk by, of Alzheimer's by about 70%. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really um, trying to reduce your, your, any of your, we call them vascular risk factors, blood pressure, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking, absolutely. Wow. We've got about 30 seconds left for you, doctor. I wonder if you could real quickly just talk to the patients out there who maybe are afraid to come for an evaluation or maybe a loved one might want to think about helping someone early rather than later, because I'm guessing you see many patients that you wish you'd have seen a year or two or five ago. Too late. Yeah. So, I mean, if there is lots and lots of memory dysfunction and patients are in the middle of Alzheimer's, it's way too late. We're trying to, if mom or dad has even a little bit of memory problems, repeating things, they need evaluated and, and seen because the sooner you hit this disease, the better. So we at NeuroCare evaluate patients for early memory dysfunction. Um, and then if we feel someone is appropriate and they have interest in a clinical trial, that's where patients can get help at Neuroscience Research Center. Wow, amazing. Excellent. Okay. Um, we need another couple hours here, doctor. Uh, yeah. We, it's we, a we fun to, topic. We'd yeah, love, to we love to have you back again. I mean, sure. it's very sure. interesting, very interesting to say the least. So thank you, Dr. Ryan Drake, neurologist at NeuroCare Center and principal investigator at Neuroscience Research Center. We'd like to remind you that we'd like to remind our listeners if you suspect you have a medical issue, Please contact your healthcare provider. Thanks to our sponsors, Altman Health Systems, Studio Arts and Glass, Genuine Appraisals, and Liquidations. As always, we thank our listeners for joining us on Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Have a healthy week, and we'll talk to you right next Friday at News Talk 1480 WHBC. Thank you very much, doctor.